jury selection is underway in the hush money case against former President Donald Trump, who has now become the first former U.S. president and the first leading presidential candidate to ever stand trial on criminal charges. The case is being brought eight years after it allegedly happened and seven months before the 2024 election. And many legal analysts are arguing that it's a case that Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg never should have pursued. Hello, everyone. This is Outnumbered. I'm Emily Campagno here with my co-host, Harris Faulkner, and also joining us today, Fox and Friends first co-host, Carly Shimkus, Hudson Institute senior fellow, Rebecca Heinrichs, and co-anchor of America's Newsroom and host of the Fox Nation special, Battle for the Arctic, with Bill Hemmer, which we will get into later on yeah. in the show, Bill Hemmer. Now, we've just heard from the former president just moments before the trial began, and he says that the case is political persecution, and it's an assault on our country. Listen. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. There's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. And it's a country that's failing. It's a country that's run by an incompetent man who's very much involved in this case. This is really an attack on a political opponent. That's all it is. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. With that, let's go live to Eric Sean, who's outside the New York State Supreme Court with more details. Eric. Emily, well, maybe you can hear behind me a uh, Trump motorcade that supports the former president. Uh, so it's going to be kind of loud. Uh, they're back from a break. And just before that break, the prosecutor, Joshua Steinglass, indicated that the prosecution is going to ask the judge to hold the former president in contempt contempt of court for his attacks on some of the witnesses. Uh, as you may know, Judge Juan Mershon earlier today uh, declined the defense request that he recuse himself because of an alleged conflict of interest. Turns out that the judge's daughter works for a political consulting firm in Chicago that has done work for, former pres for President Biden's a campaign and other prominent Democrats. The former president has been attacking this case as well as attacking uh, many of the witnesses and others despite a, a gag order that's in place that he not attack jurors, witnesses, the prosecutors, the lawyers, or their family members. We'll see what happens with that prosecution request to hold him in contempt of court as the uh, trial is now back in, the proceedings are now back in underway. The judge declined to recuse himself, saying he has no agenda, that he wants to follow the law, but this has not stopped the sparring between the prosecution and the defense attorneys. Uh, Judge Mershan handed President Trump's defense a victory over the Access Hollywood tapes. The prosecution wanted to let those into evidence, but the judge said that the vulgar remarks that the president made on those tapes have nothing to do with the charges here, and they were just salacious, and any other allegations of sexual misconduct by the former president just hearsay and have not been proven, so that will not be allowed. But he will allow the National Enquirer situation with Kara McDougal, the former Playboy Playmate model who claims she had an affair with the president. He has denied that. That, of course, part of the uh, so-called catch-and-kill scheme in order to have her paid $150,000 by the National Enquirer to keep her story quiet, much as it is alleged Stormy Daniels was paid $130,000 uh, to keep her story quiet by Michael Cohen. And speaking of Cohen, the uh, convicted felon who uh, went to federal prison for campaign violations, right now both sides have been discussing how much of his uh, background will be allowed in the trial, what the jury will be told about his uh, pleading guilty to various campaign violations uh, that put him in the pokey uh, uh, for a while. So we'll see how that turns out. So as it stands right now, no potential juror has been uh, seated at all in any of the questioning. That will be a very lengthy process, that 42 questionnaires, questions about their views of uh, the former president and the views about this case. So uh, that probably won't happen until after lunch. So this looks like a slow-moving trial. This process expected to take two weeks before the opening arguments even begin. Emily, back to you.
Eric, Sean, thank you so much. Now, George Washington University law professor Jonathan Turley, he's one of many legal experts sharing their opinion on the case. And he argues that D.A. Alvin Bragg doesn't have a legal leg to stand on. Watch. Everything about this case is, in my view, legally absurd. You know, this case is basically a state misdemeanor that had run out on the statute of limitations. And Bragg was forced, uh, after he declined for a long time to bring this charge, uh, to do so. His predecessor rejected it. Uh, and so they took a, mis a dead misdemeanor and bootstrapped it into effectively trying a federal crime. But the federal crime here under election law was rejected by the Department of Justice. They didn't feel that this should be charged. So you have this crazy case that's going to go forward, and it's going to turn on the testimony of people like Michael Cohen. And Michael Cohen just recently had a judge call him a serial perjurer. Uh, and he's going to appear as the center of this case. Bill Hemmer, so much Sounds to unpack simple, here. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, walk us through what we need to know, what uh, stands out to you. Well, I'm not a lawyer, but here's what I've learned. Misdemeanors elevated to, fel to felonies, which is what uh, Turley's talking about there. There's a statute of limitations that expired for this case. Did you know that? Yes. It was extended by a year because <laughs> of COVID rules. Now, I don't know. We live in New York, right? Mm -hmm. Can you name a case in New York where that has applied? I don't know. There are parking tickets out there. There's speeding <laughs> tickets, maybe. Um, Andy McCarthy, whose opinion I trust thoroughly, he said to Dane and me earlier today, he said, as a legal hallmark in America, the accused must know what they're accused of. Remember this elevated felony? Mm -hmm. He was acting to commit another crime. Uh, and what Turley says is right. The Department of Justice passed, and so did the Southern District of New York. The Southern District of New York had a chance to go after Donald Trump, and they passed. I mean, what does that tell you? Um, I, I don't know necessarily if Bragg had to take this case. He could have, he could have waved it right through. Mm. You know what Donald Trump? Um, you know what his voting percentage was in 2016 and 2020? You know what, Carly? 2016 was what? 10%. Yeah, and 2020 it 12%. was? 12%. All right, so I asked this question. Has Bragg brought a case that he can win? I don't know. But if he gets the right jury, there's a chance. My answer to that, my bet, Harris, is the answer is no. But when we talk about that jury, part of the motions this morning that the judge assessed was a motion on behalf of the jury and the jury pool, right? And saying, essentially, how are we going to get a fair jury here? The judge responded, this is the most exhaustive questionnaire he's ever seen, he says. He says, at the end, there'll be no doubt how the jurors feel about Trump. But at the end of the day, as you saw him standing there before mm -hmm. the cameras, he's essentially saying, look, Americans, I'm standing for you. Well, it's interesting. So you brought up the 12 percent, and I was reading uh, an op-ed this morning that said that if the jury is made up of 12 percent of people who even have the thought that there might be reasonable doubt, whether they support Trump or not, that's a hung jury. So it is interesting, right, that, that 12 percent number or any percentage, really. What you talked about, though, the, the two layers of this, Andrew Tchaikovsky was just talking about on my show last hour, defraud the books. Did he do that? This is what the prosecution has to prove. And then what Bill Hemmer just said, specific intent to commit a crime. And doing that, that's a high bar. That's why you bring in the salaciousness of Karen McDougal, who says she had a 10-month-long, you know, hot, steamy affair with Donald Trump and was paid by American media $150,000 to take her story and then kill her story, allegedly, but she got that money. So that's why you bring that up in a case that has nothing to do with any of that. Because you're going to have to prove all these other things. One bottom line for Donald Trump today, this is the weakest of the cases. So no matter how he goes forward, it is rather uphill. And I liked what he said earlier. I like when any defendant talks this way, it is my honor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. Respecting the court. I've heard you talk about that and the importance of doing that when you've got a wall against you. Yeah. Right. And that he consistently does. Um, Carly, let's dive into this. Let's do brass tacks here. Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about, the right to know what you're accused of, the specific intent for the underlying crime, the argument here is, what crime are you talking about? Yeah. You never talked about it in the indictment. You still haven't told me. And if it's federal law, which we think that's what you're saying, then you have no jurisdiction over it, Alvin Bragg, let alone it ran in the statute of limitations. Yeah. So that's why my money is that this is going to be thrown out because what 
fair, impartial Norman, normal-minded American will sit in front of that and say, yes, this rises to the level of eight felonies. It frankly doesn't. It should have been tossed out years ago, but unfortunately, we've already spent millions as taxpayers right. taxpayers paying for this. Yeah, and uh, there is so much to talk about when it comes to this case. I remember a year ago when Alvin Bragg brought these charges down. The first time we heard 34 felony counts for falsifying business records. I remember thinking, how do you charge somebody for allegedly mislabeling something in your own personal bookkeeping? Mm. And I was talking to <laughs> Katie Trukowski about that great lawyer who also appears on Fox News. And she was saying that's going to be a real big problem for prosecutors because they're going to have to prove, get this, they're going to have to prove that Trump or whoever, when they mm -hmm. physically wrote in the logs, we are paying Michael Cohen, Trump's lawyer, for his legal services, that they did that with criminal intent. How are they going to prove that when Trump never well, even knew that these records were going to be looked at by anybody? And the only reason Alvin Bragg has them is because Michael Cohen's house got raided. So I know we got a roll, uh, and I'll, I'll wrap this up uh, here. But, I mean, this is far from an open and shut case. But what else would you call it? You're, you're well, getting legal services. Right. Isn't that what you would put in the ledger? And I'll tell you what the judge called Michael Cohen. He called him a serial perjurer, Rebecca. Yeah. And yet he is supposedly the linchpin upon which this whole case rests. And he doesn't have a gag order. So he's been running his mouth all around town and all over media, telling exactly what he thinks under no oath. So there's no threat of perjury charges for this person that apparently is the star witness for New York Manhattan DA. Look, I got a great, great way to wrap this up here. Rich Lowry, we, this was commended by Andy McCarthy, so I also respect him, and so check this out. Rich Lowry said, speaking about Bragg, lesser prosecutors would have been daunted by the prospect of creating a national melodrama and norm-breaking prosecution of a former president over what is, in essence, a misdemeanor business records charge. I want that norm-breaking point. I want to pull that thread. Donald Trump has regularly been accused of this president who is norm-breaking, you know, whenever he was president. But here we have him, to Harris's point, respecting the court, walking in, respecting what the court's going to do, respecting the institution, while you have the prosecutor doing all of the norm-breaking. Quite the contrast. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.